Good afternoon. Welcome to today's symposium on structural violence. I'd like to um, especially welcome our speakers today, Dr. Ju Young Lee and Dr. Joseph Richardson, Jr. Um, it's really a pleasure to have them uh, accept our invitation to be here to speak about a very important research that they're conducting on this topic of structural violence. Um, the Baha'i Chair is very pleased that it can collaborate with the Department of Sociology's Critical Race Initiative on these uh, series of lectures and symposia on the topic of structural racism and the root causes of prejudice. And today, we are really pleased that we take structural racism to a new dimension of looking at the structural causes of uh, violence. Now, it's interesting because um, today's, as I said, presentation looks at the systematic ways in which social structures injure, impair, and harm disadvantage individuals and populations. Um, and I think the interest in this topic for the Baha'i Chair is one um, that has been ongoing for several, several years now, looking at structural racism, because uh, we are interested in seeing at what point we can begin to explore with scholars and experts um, potential policy uh, that can begin to um, have some impact on, on this very important issue. Uh, and I think that is something that is an ongoing process uh, that we are engaged in, but certainly one that I think is extremely important. And I'm really pleased that on this campus we have great support for this endeavor. Um, so I, I would like to just say that uh, it is a topic that uh, is not often talked about, structural violence. And it's a topic that I think um, can be approached from an interdisciplinary lens, which it in fact gives it a lot more, um, it gives it a much better perspective to understand. And so I'm, I'd like to begin by introducing our first speaker today, who comes to us from our good neighbor in the north, Canada, although he's a native of California. Um, Dr. Ju Young Lee is an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Toronto, and he is also a senior fellow in Yale University's Urban Ethnography Project. He writes and teaches about hip hop, gun violence, and health disparities. He has many publications, has been granted many awards, and writes a personal blog, Guns, Rap, Crime. Please welcome Dr. Lee. Thank you for the uh, warm introduction. I just wanted to uh, quickly thank Dr. Mahmoudi and Dr. Ray for reaching out to me and inviting me. I'm very honored to be here and to have this uh, stage to share some of my work with you. And I wanted to give a quick shout out to uh, Dr. Richardson. Um, we had a great lunch today. Uh, a group of colleagues got together. And I've admired his work from afar for the past few years. And I've met a bunch of people who kept saying, you have to meet this guy, Joe Richardson, down at Maryland. And what a cool way to bring us together in an event like this. So I wanted to talk today a little bit about a book that I've been writing for the past few years about non-fatal gunshot victims. And I initially became interested in this topic while writing my first book, which is called Blowing Up, Rap Dreams in South Central. And Blowing Up is a long-term ethnographic study about young black men from South Central LA and other working class and working poor neighborhoods in Southern California who have dreams of blowing up, which is uh, like slang for making it in the music industry. The book in large part tells the stories of young people who are growing up in the shadows of Crip and Blood gang violence, 
and the glittering entertainment industry. And I examine how young people's lives are structured and shaped by these pursuits of trying to make it. And I look at how their lives are changed over time. One of the young men that I followed most closely and who's one of the main characters in this book goes by the name of Flawless, and he's pictured here to your left. Flawless, when I met him, was one of the most respected battle rappers in a local scene in Lamert Park, which the filmmaker John Singleton calls the Black Greenwich Village. And he was known for being just a very ferocious battle rapper. He was performing in different venues, and he started to catch the attention of record labels who were approaching him to possibly sign him. And then, in the middle of my fieldwork, Flawless got shot. And this um, shocked a lot of people. It was a pivotal moment for me as an ethnographer because it forced me to confront and think about gun violence for the first time. And I observed as Flawless struggled to adjust to his new body. He lived with a colostomy bag, which he still wears. And this was a big source of shame for him. It, it's, it was a very difficult transition for him to move into a disabled body. I also watched as this single event seemed to derail all of the work, all of the hard work that he had done over many years to try and build his career in the music industry. And through this process, I began wondering, what's it like for others? How are, how are other people's lives affected by gun violence? And so I turned to look at the epidemiological data. And I was floored. I was shocked to find that most people who get shot don't die. In fact, the CDC estimates that only about one in five shootings are fatal. Another way to think of this is that 80% of the people who get shot in drive-by shootings, armed robberies, and other kinds of violent street encounters live to see another day. And so this raises a number of questions which motivates and inspires this new book that I want to talk to you about today. The most basic of which is what happens? What happens to survivors? How are their lives impacted by this event of getting shot? And the final question is what can we do? How can we use empirical research to come up with different interventions. And I think this is a really cool time in gun violence research because there's a concerted interdisciplinary effort to really think of different ways that we can intervene, both at the institutional level in terms of designing and changing policies that might uh, reduce risks for gun violence, and also at the interpersonal level of how uh, family members, friends, and others who interact with gunshot victims can help lessen suffering. And so I embarked on a study that was primarily focused on the everyday lives and experiences of gunshot victims. This, the study that I'm going to tell you about today comes from a two-year study that I did in the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Health and Society Scholars at the University of Pennsylvania. And I began this study doing in-depth interviews inside the outpatient trauma clinic, which is located in the hospital at the University of Pennsylvania. And those who are familiar with Philadelphia know that uh, the hospital at Penn is one of the two major trauma centers in the city. The other one is located in North Philadelphia in Temple University's hospital. I did 40 in-depth interviews, and I would go on Friday afternoons between the hours of 12 and 5 p.m and hang out in the clinic. Uh, doctors and nurses allowed me to sit in an empty exam room, and I waited. Nurses on the ward would screen patients and ask them if they had been shot and if they were interested in talking to me. If they said yes, they would bring uh, gunshot victims into my room where I would interview them and talk to them about what it was like to be living wounded. Alternatively, I also sat with people when they were waiting to be seen by doctors or when they were waiting for test results and that kind of thing. These were open-ended interviews, so I started by basically just asking people what they were being seen for, and then this would lead to conversations about you know, the different injuries that people had sustained at the time of the shooting, 
the different ways that these injuries were affecting their lives, how they got shot, and, and some of our conversations even delved into existential matters about how this event would structure and shape the ways that people thought about their futures. And the vibe that I got in these interviews was that there was a great deal of uncertainty, that young people in an abrupt instant were transformed into uh, disabled bodies and had a lot of doubt and fear about what that meant for their lives and their health over time. In addition to doing these interviews, I also followed nine of the gunshot victims around in their everyday lives. And during this phase of my data collection, I tried to really just immerse myself into people's everyday routines. And I tried to be there with them as they uh, navigated everyday life. Most of this field work was actually spent in people's homes or in their apartments. A great deal of the people that I enrolled in this study were living with different disabilities that made it difficult for them to get around. Others were suffering from post-traumatic stress and were scared to leave their house at night. Um, so most of my time was spent with them in living rooms or in their bedroom talking about the things that they were going through. I also helped people run errands. I spent time with people when they were meeting with specialists and other doctors. I sat in with gunshot victims when they met with social workers and district attorneys. I attended hearings if they were testifying against people suspected of shooting them. And I also spent time following people around who were hustling for pain medication to treat the different kinds of injuries and pain that they were suffering. And one of the, as a side note, chronic pain is a really uh, central part of living as a, a, as a wounded young person. Like many of the victims that I met were suffering from excruciating pain. They had retained bullets, shrapnel, stuff, stuff that was really difficult to deal with and live with. I also went back to Philadelphia um, whenever I could find time to get away from teaching and research, and I tried to reconnect with these young people as well. So today I wanted to tell you about one of the first people that I met in the hospital. I call him Eddie, and Eddie's story brings a lot of things to the surface, but the thing that I think, think about when I think about Eddie is that his story really changed the way that I thought about near death as a phenomenon. Eddie got shot in his tow truck. It was a Saturday night, and he was driving around Philly with Damarion, a local teenager from his neighborhood. Even though Eddie usually worked alone and preferred the solitude of working alone, he sometimes would bring Damarion along when he could use the extra hand. Similarly, Eddie thought of Damarion like a little brother. Once, Eddie told me, he's sort of like family to me. I want to help him, but he just runs with the wrong crowd. He's always out ripping and running with the young bulls. That night, Eddie and Damarion were out on one of their regular runs, towing different cars to different lots when they received a call to tow a car near where both of them lived. They drove to the scene, and Eddie double parked his tow truck next to a car that matched the description, and they waited for the owner. But the owner was nowhere to be found. Eddie then called the owner, and the owner didn't pick up. And so they waited for a few more minutes. During this time, Eddie checked his voicemail. He was sitting in the car, and he was just about to leave when it happened. And the first time I met Eddie, he had this really eerie and vivid description. He could recount with just pristine detail the moment he knew something was wrong. He describes looking into his uh, side mirror and seeing somebody run up alongside his car. He says, at this point, I think we're about to get jacked, so I try to drive away. But before he could even start the engine, Eddie heard the sounds of gunfire popping off one round after another. Eddie remembers knowing that he'd been hit right away. He looked down and saw a deep circle of blood forming in the middle of his chest. The stain spread outwards until it had covered most of his white t-shirt. Eddie said, I was mostly in shock. Everything happened so fast, and he kept shooting. In total, Eddie got shot seven times. Two bullets hit him in the chest, four went through his legs, and one went through his shoulder. He remembers, the dude was yelling like, get out the car, get out the car. 
but I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. The gunman then ran off, leaving Eddie and Demarion panicking in their car. Demarion responded quickly and dragged Eddie's near lifeless body out of the truck and left him on a lawn and ran to get help. During this time, Eddie remembers hearing the sounds of uh, the howling sounds of sirens in the distance. He remembers seeing the flickering red light from the ambulance. And he remembers sort of fluttering in and out of consciousness. He also remembers a paramedic flashing a flashlight in his eyes and asking him if he knew the phone number of someone they could call. And he remembers a repeated uh, yelling of like, can you hear me, can you hear me? By the time Eddie was admitted into the ER, he had lost 70% of his blood and his heart rate, blood pressure, and body temperature were falling quickly. Doctors and nurses worked quickly to stabilize his body and administered the first of many blood transfusions. And somehow Eddie pulled through, but he doesn't remember any of this. He only remembers one thing from being in the hospital. At some point in this whole ordeal, he had an out-of-body experience and saw a white tunnel with beaming bright lights. Eddie said, I was up in the sky looking at people who were trying to save me. I saw the white tunnel and everything. So what can we learn from Eddie's story? And how does it add to our collective knowledge about gun violence? Well, on one level, his story is an all too familiar reminder of racial and ethnic disparities in gun violence victimization in the US. So here is a uh, chart that I kind of threw together on PowerPoint that shows homicide firearm deaths amongst men in the US in the age group of 20 to 24, which overlaps with sort of the peak time in the life course when people are at risk of violent injury. We see right away that the rate at which black men in this age group are murdered with firearms is significantly higher than men in other groups. And the rates aren't even close. So the, black, the rate at which black men were killed in 2013 by firearms was 80 per 100,000 and the rate at which other groups, men from other groups were murdered with firearms aren't even in double digits, right? So there's a significant gap and disparity in who gets shot and killed in the US. And this isn't just um, something that pops up in one year. If we look over time, uh, this is the same, this is data covering the same age group, men between the ages of 20 and 24 who are killed by firearms. The top line that you see that kind of has like a a peak and a, that, the gray line represents the, the rate at which young black men are murdered in the US with firearms. The bottom line that's darker represents the average of all other racial ethnic groups in the US. And so we see dating back to at least even the 70s, a persistent disparity um, in who gets killed with firearms. But as I alluded to earlier, most people who get shot don't die. And fatal shootings are just the tip of the a much larger iceberg. So if we look at non-fatal shootings, we see similar kinds of disparities and patterns. So in 2013, the CDC reported that 60, about 62,000 people were non-fatally wounded in gunfire in the US. 55,229 of these victims were men. And out of this population, 23,653 were black men. One way to think of this is that black men who make up about five to five and a half or six percent of the US population make up almost 40 percent of the non fatal shootings in the US. And some of you may notice that the columns to your right don't add up to 55,000. So those are other groups in this data set that are also men. And that's because 15,000 uh, individuals who were non fatally shot didn't self identify at the time when they were shot. So the proportion that which, or by which young black men are non-fatally wounded in the US might actually be higher. We just don't have that data. So what's it like in Philadelphia, a city that since 2010 has averaged somewhere in the ballpark of almost a murder a day? Well, if we look at Philly PD's data, we see that in 2011, which is a year than I, when I was doing my field work, um, that there were roughly about 1,400 non-fatal shootings in, in the city of Philadelphia. 
1,200 of these non-fatal gunshot victims were black African American. And Philly PD doesn't include gender in their data on non-fatal shootings, but it's a, you see a very significant disparity here, that 85% of the non-fatal shootings in the city of Philadelphia are black African American victims. All right, and it's not even close. Now, as I alluded, or I didn't allude to this, but Eddie's story also helps us think about near death in different ways. Right? And near death is this phenomenon that we've been writing about, or people have been writing about since the beginning of time. It's this experience that provokes simultaneously a sense of wonder, curiosity, and also fear and anxiety. And most of the accounts about near death talk about the phenomenology of near death, the experiences that people have as they slip closer to the end of life. And most of the narratives that we have about near death talk about how this, the, the experience of thinking that you're dying is so jarring that when people awake and they find that they're alive, that they emerge with a sense of moral and spiritual clarity. Right? And this is something that we see beginning back with Plato. So Plato was perhaps one of the early, wrote one of the earliest accounts of near death in the Republic. In book 10, he describes the story of the myth of Ur. So Ur was this soldier who um, people thought had died and was placed on a funeral pyre. And just before they were going to light him on fire, he woke up and told people about his experience of leaving his body, of meeting different souls in this um, other dimension, and of seeing this bright pillar of light. Right? And he came back from the brink of death to tell people to live a better life. Right? Then in the 1890s, a Swiss geologist named Albert von St. Gellenheim published a small essay called Remarks on Fatal Falls in the yearbook of the Swiss Alpine Club. And this little essay was inspired by St. Gallenheim's own brush with near death. So he was an avid mountain climber and would go climbing in the Swiss Alps and fell one day and remembers thinking that he was gonna die and remembers a sense of timelessness as he fell from the mountain. Uh, but he survived, and this experience inspired him to go and talk to other people who had also had their near brushes with death. He, he, he went out and started talking to other climbers who had fallen from the Swiss Alps. He talked to uh, people who had been wounded in combat. He talked to people who had suffered accidents, like near drownings. And he compiled a bunch of these stories, and the stories are, are remarkably similar to the kinds of accounts that emerge in the myth of Ur. We get a story of different stories about people having out-of-body experiences, about people seeing bright lights, and then St. Gallenheim adds a little nuance and, and adds the experience that people have of timelessness as they think they're dying. And then in the mid-70s, a psychiatrist named Raymond Moody came along and published what would become the first comprehensive and comparative study of near death. And Moody interviewed a bunch of his patients who had had near encounters with death and compiled the 15 most commonly reported experiences that people have when they think they're dying. These included things like hearing oneself pronounced dead, a feeling of peace, hearing unusual voices, being in a dark tunnel, having an out-of-body experience, meeting beings, uh, having a panoramic life review, and, and so forth. But the most commonly reported experience was, again, this experience of being basked in a bright white light. Now, I just wanted to add as an aside because the near-death literature has kind of evolved over the last 10 years, and more recently, neuroscientists and neurobiologists have weighed in on, 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 on the study of near-death. And some of their hypotheses are, you know, argue that these experiences that people have are caused by sedatives that are administered when a person is being resuscitated. Others argue that these experiences are caused by oxygen deprivation to the brain and to, to the eyes. And so one of the papers that's um, been cited a lot talks about how 
Um, tunnel vision is the experience of the retinas failing as oxygen uh, is deprived to the eyes. Uh, others argue that these visions and experiences are caused by an overstimulation of the temporal lobe, the warehouse of dreams and memories and so forth. And so in different ways, we've been fixated on near death as this standalone event, as this situated phenomenon that we should try to explain, you know, from accounts of what happens to why they happen. Uh, most of the research on near death has really focused on those brief moments when people think they're dying. But the thing that I found interesting about my research is that many of the young people I met who reported having near death experiences didn't just sort of wake up in the hospital and say that they had come back from the brink of death with a sense of clarity uh, about their lives and themselves. Most of them were just happy to be alive and disoriented and then intensely curious about how to make sense of what they had been through. And this inspired many of them to reach out and talk to other people, like family members, friends, lovers, coworkers, and other people around them who would help them make sense of uh, what they had been through. And so, you know, I think as a sociologist, the interesting thing about near death is that it's an evolving narrative. It's something that people negotiate through interactions with others around them. There's a collective experience of sense making that unfolds after somebody has had a near death experience. And this is something that um, I write about in this new book. Now, some of these interactions end up framing the near death experience as what I call a traumatic rebirth, as a new beginning in a person's life, a new beginning filled with hope as something that will lead to important self-discoveries in the future. And you know, these interactions leave gunshot victims feeling that the, the near-death encounter has some kind of important existential purpose in their lives and that they'll emerge a better person as a result. And I think, as an aside, we tend to think about, or psychologists tend to write about resiliency as this attribute of the individual, that certain individuals have dispositions and attitudes that make them especially hardy in the face of adversity. But I think that as a sociologist, we could start thinking about resiliency as something that's located in people's relationships, that it's something that's emerging from interactions that people have and how people frame traumatic experiences. So, Eddie would always talk about his mom as this important source of social support in his life. And the first time I met him, he started crying, remembering the first day he was released from the hospital. And you know, he, he talked about how his mom was really this uh, buffer who kept trying to build him up and who kept trying to tell him to not think about this experience as the end of his life. And so he said, she told me that it must mean something that I'm still here, like this wasn't my time, so I'm destined to do something new, right? And other family members would underscore this narrative. They would tell Eddie to, to not give up hope and that he should consider um, going to school and enrolling in classes at a junior college and that this didn't need to be the, the event that ruined the rest of his life, right? And so they were framing this as a moment of traumatic rebirth. Similarly, Eddie also reached out to a local pastor, and he had grown up going to a Baptist church as a kid, but as a teenager and a young adult, he had uh, stopped going to church, but this event inspired a sense of curiosity, right? And so he reached out to a pastor who, who underscored some of the same kind of message. He told me, he told me to think about this as a lesson, to slow down and focus on what's really important, like my family, right? And so different interactions frame near-death experiences as something that can lead to something positive down the road, right? Now, at the same time, other interactions frame near-death encounters in a different light. And I call these master tragedies, so different people who console and meet with gunshot victims, would talk with them, but the theme that would emerge from these interactions wasn't the sense of hope or a sense of future possibility, it was a sense that this event would be 
the end of their life or that it would be a permanently disabling and constraining event that would forever change their life chances, right? And ironically, many of these interactions were coming from people who were ostensibly trying to help the person, who were expressing their grief in certain ways that led people to see near death as this tragedy that would haunt them forever. So he told me a lot of stories about one of his close friends who would always come over and who was really upset about what had happened to Eddie. He came over and was hurting. I could tell. He just kept saying he was mad because I had just got my towing business going and now that was going to change forever. So in this interaction, Eddie, Eddie reflected on a friend who had come over and who was first upset and then he was really saddened and he kept saying things like, this is going to change things forever, right? And these subtle messages ended up uh, discouraging Eddie and making him feel as if this near-death experience would forever constrain his life chances, right? And as I alluded to earlier, this, it was ironic in a sense because the friend was coming over to help him. So just to kind of return, like I think the, the study of near-death is fascinating for a number of reasons, but for most of the time we've been stuck viewing near-death as this fleeting experience, as is something that happens in a situation, it happens in a flash, and then it passes and it leaves a person forever changed. But I think as a sociologist, one of the more interesting things from this field work was watching and observing and tracing how the meanings of near death evolve as a person interacts with different people who have a different take on what they've been through. And as Dr. Mahmoudi alluded to earlier, I think one of the kind of interesting things about uh, this symposium and then also the work on gun violence is that people are starting to talk about interventions now. And, you know, I think there are a few things that have emerged from my field work that I'd like to just kind of end with. And I would love to hear ideas from, from any of you if you've had experience or know of interventions. But one thing that I noticed right away was the need to uh, increase continued care for folks who are wounded in our streets. We seem to know that uh, continued access to rehabilitative care is absolutely essential for our soldiers who come back from combat and whose bodies are broken and who are suffering from post-traumatic stress. And we, we've had quite a bit of success with different projects like the Wounded Warrior Project and so forth. And yet, these same types of programs don't exist for people who are wounded in our streets every day. And I think a lot of this has to do with the ways that we collectively frame the victims of violence, whether in combat or in our streets. We tend to see young men and women who are shot and killed and wounded in places like Philadelphia or Baltimore as people who are somehow deserving of their fate. Uh, we, we tend to think of them as gang members or people who are caught up in activities that would uh, increase their risk factors for being injured. And this simply wasn't the case in my field work, and it's not the case and others who have studied the experiences of gunshot victims. Many people live in neighborhoods in which everyday life is dangerous and where you can simply be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And, and these shootings can have all kinds of disastrous repercussions on a person's life course. Similarly, we've had a lot of success with home health care for the elderly who are not so mobile. And so nurses go and visit people who can't get around and yet we don't have a similar kind of system for people who suffer from mental health issues. You know, many of the gunshot victims, so as part of my IRB, I had a referral network. I had different numbers and websites and you know, data that people could use in their recovery. And I would refer people, I'd say, you know, there, there's free mental health care that you can get. You can go see this person who's a social worker and just arrange to talk to them about what you're going through. And many of the young men that I talked to in Philadelphia said that they felt intimidated about going in and speaking to a clinician or speaking to a social worker, and that they felt much more comfortable uh, having somebody like me or anyone just come into their own home and listen to them. Um, and then the last point, which I kind of alluded to now, is that we know from a lot of research in, in nursing and in social work that the people around a trauma 
victim often get over the trauma much faster than the person who actually experienced it. And I think sometimes, you know, this might sound kind of hokey, but just the, the power of listening, of being an attentive listener, uh, paid humongous dividends in, in, in at least the self-reports that I got from the young man that I would visit. Thank you.